Well, hello everybody. It's Miss Susan from the Crystal Lake Public Library. And we are embarking on a wonderful journey. I will be reading The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles. It was written by Julie Andrews Edwards. And it was one of my favorite books that I read to my children when they were younger. This is Snuggle In Story Time. So that just means you get to sit and listen, snuggle in with your favorite blanket or your stuffy or maybe your parent or your grandparent and go on an adventure. Because guess what? You have a beautiful brain and that beautiful brain is your pathway to your imagination. So we are going to take a trip to Wang Doodle Land over this series of several evenings where I'm just going to read and you're going to listen. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 1 It was a crisp, sunny October afternoon and Benjamin, Thomas, and Melinda Potter were visiting the Bramblewood Zoo. They hadn't particularly wanted to visit the zoo, but Mrs. Potter, their mother, had been very firm about it. Your father has been working extremely hard, she said, and I think he needs an afternoon of peace and quiet. Here's some money. I suggest you go to the zoo. There was no arguing with Mrs. Potter in this mood. So the three children had dutifully taken the bus from the stop at the corner of their street and had ridden through the pretty university town of Bramblewood as far as the zoo. Although it was the end of October and very cold, the sun was shining brightly from an unusually clear sky. Only a few clouds on the horizon gave the hint of possible rain. Late autumn leaves blew along the pavement and rolled in through the main gates of the zoo, as if inviting the children to follow. On this lovely Sunday, the place was crowded with visitors, and there were popcorn sellers, balloon vendors, and a man pushing a yellow cart piled high with toys. Children yelled happily as they scampered to the rides and to the animal cages, and in spite of their early reluctance to venture out, Benjamin, Thomas, and Lindy had to admit, now that they were there, that the zoo didn't seem a bad place to visit after all. I want to see the tigers, Tom announced. I want to see donkeys and the ducks, countered Lindy. Donkeys and ducks, Tom scoffed. Anyone can see a donkey or a duck, and you don't have to go to the zoo for it. That's just a waste of time. I know, I know, Lindy replied. I just feel like seeing a donkey and a duck today. I don't know why. Oh, look, if we're going to spend the afternoon trailing around looking at animals like that, well, we're not, Ben interrupted firmly. He was used to his younger brother and sister squabbling at each other. We're going to go see the elephants first because I'm the oldest and I'm in charge. Come on. The children visited the elephants, then the lions and the tigers. They slowly moved on to see llamas and leopards and rhinos and reindeer, crocodiles and hippopotamuses and brown bears and polar bears. They watched the performing seals, and Lindy saw three ducks and twelve penguins, which made her very happy. Tom suggested that they visit the aquarium. They wandered through the dim corridors, whose only light came from the many illuminated tanks in which turtles, sharks, eels, and other underwater creatures were to be seen. It was gloomy and damp inside. Lindy was very glad when Ben chose to go to the reptile house, but she clung tightly to his hand as she gazed at the cobras and rattlesnakes and a giant python. I love one of those for a pet, Tom said enthusiastically. Oh, I think they're gross, really gross, Lindy exclaimed. You just say that because you're scared of them. 
No, I don't. They're just not my favorite things. But I'm not scared. Then why are you sucking your thumb? I like the taste. Cut it out, you two, said Ben. <sighs> what shall we do next? Lindy announced that she was tired, cold, and extremely hungry. The children bought a bag of delicious, sticky-looking donuts and three cups of hot, sugary chocolate. Carefully, they carried the steaming mugs to a bench that caught the late afternoon sunshine in which was close to a fenced yard containing two large, disdainful-looking giraffes. Lindy had no sooner sat down than one of those giraffes spotted the doughnut she had in her hand and immediately undulated towards her on spindly legs, looking as though her, his wobbly knees would buckle beneath him at any moment. The animal lifted his long neck over the wire netting and brought his face within inches of Lindy's, just as she was about to take a large mouthful of her donut. The giraffe and the child gazed at each other with serious concentration for a moment. Then Lindy solemnly said, No, and moved herself and her donut farther along the bench out of the giraffe's way. That's really an extraordinary animal, mused Ben as he watched. Imagine being born with a neck like that. Imagine being able to reach the tops of trees quite easily. I'd like that, said Tom. You could see the world from up there. I like giraffes a lot, Lindy spoke with her mouth full. So if you could have any animal out of the zoo, which one would you take home, Ben said suddenly. A python. Tom spoke without hesitation. Gross, said Lindy. I'd have a penguin. What would you have, Ben? Mm, I don't know. Ben thought about it as he sipped his hot chocolate. I'd like something unusual. A orangutan, maybe. Perhaps, or an anteater. Maybe a gorilla. Oh, you'll excuse me by butting in said a voice immediately behind the children. But if you are looking for something really unusual, have you ever considered a wangdoodle? The children spun around. Sitting on the grass behind them, knees drawn up almost to his chin, was a small man. He was holding a rolled umbrella made of clear plastic. I beg your pardon, sir, Ben said. Did you say something? Oh, yes, yes, I did. I said, have you ever considered a wangdoodle? The little man got up slowly. He had a round, cheerful face with bright blue sparkling eyes and a few hairs still growing on his balding head. They were long and gray and flying in all directions. He wore an old brown sports jacket and a blue checked shirt with a purple, yellow spotted scarf tied in a casual bow. With a purple, oh yes, and his shabby brown trousers and old but highly polished shoes. Ben said, Um, excuse me, but I don't think I've ever heard of a wangdoodle, sir. The remarkable looking gentleman smiled, leaned on his umbrella, and crossed one small foot over the other. Oh, that's not surprising. It's an extremely rare creature. In fact, I believe there is only one left. In the whole world. What does it look like? Tom asked. Oh, well, I have not actually seen the Wangdoodle myself, countered the stranger, although I do hope to one day. Then how do you know about it? Lindy wanted to know. Ah, uh, that's a long and complicated story, he replied. Here we are chatting away, and I don't even know your names. Tom tugged at Ben's sleeve. He was suspicious of the stranger and wanted to warn Ben that they should be leaving immediately and heading for home. But Lindy was already cheerfully giving out information. My name is Melinda Potter and everybody calls me Lindy. Well, how old are you, Lindy? I shall be eight on December 3rd, which means she's seven, growled Tom. Ah, but of course said the stranger, and he turned to him. And how old are you, young man? Ten, 
And my name is Thomas Potter. And I'm Benjamin Potter, Ben offered. I'm 13. What about you? What's your name? Tom wanted to know. The stranger placed a hand on his forehead. Oh, goodness me, what is my name? Oh, it seems to have escaped me for just a moment, Lindy giggled. Tom nudged Ben harder and jerked his head as though to say, let's get out of here. Oh, but that's not really any importance. What's important is that this is a most pleasant afternoon, and if I'm not mistaken, it is only two days before Halloween. Lindy gave a little hop of excitement. Do you know what I'm going to be for trick-or-treating? She asked. Let me see if I can guess, he thought for thoughtfully. Snow White? Or possibly Cinderella? No, I'm going to be a lion, she said proudly. Oh, and a very ferocious one, I'm sure. What are you going to be, Thomas? I'm going to be the hunchback of Notre Dame. And you, Benjamin? I I haven't quite decided yet. I don't know whether to be Dracula or Frankenstein. Well, I just hope I don't bump into any of you on that dark night. I think I might be scared. Maybe I'll change my mind and go as a wangdoodle, Lindy said brightly. The little man chuckled. What a good idea! You know, you really don't think there is such an animal, Tom blurted out. Ben actually thought so, too though he was too polite to say so. Oh, I assure you that the wang doodle exists, said the man. Look it up in the dictionary when you get home. What does it look like? Lindy asked. That's sort of a hard thing to describe. It's a little like a moose or a horse, perhaps, but with fantastic horns, and I believe it has rather short legs. Where does it live? inquired Tom. Oh, far, far away, which is a good thing, for if it were here, it would be in a cage, like all the other, other poor animals. I do so hate seeing things in cages, don't you? Then why do you come to the zoo if you don't like it? Lindy asked with her usual candor. Well, I come to study the animals. I'd prefer to study them in their natural environments, but I just haven't the time. Ben suddenly remembered to look at his watch. Gosh, we're late. Um, you'll have to excuse us, sir, but we have got to go now or we'll miss our bus. The little man took a large watch from his pocket. Oh, yes, it is late, he said. Ooh, we'd better hurry because it is going to rain. He unfurled his umbrella with a flourish and opened it over his head. Large yellow butterflies were painted all over the clear plastic. Here, allow me to escort you, he said, and he walked briskly towards the front gate of the zoo. Lindy fell into step behind him. I love your umbrella, she said admiringly. I bought it because it's cheery and it makes people look up. Have you noticed how nobody ever looks up? The man's voice was suddenly irritable. Nobody looks up at chimneys or trees or anything against the sky or the tops of buildings. Everybody just looks down at the pavement and over their shoes. The whole world could pass by them, and most people wouldn't even notice. Ben and Tom quickly discovered that they were looking at the pavement as he spoke. Quickly, they lifted their heads to the sky, only to get their faces wet for it was beginning to rain. They also bumped straight into Lindy and her escort, who had come to a sudden halt. Oh, this is where the bus stop, isn't it? asked the stranger. And ah, here it comes right now. Very good timing that I would hate to waste time, don't you? Visitors from the zoo were running for the bus or for their cars. Umbrellas seemed to be popping up everywhere. People who didn't have umbrellas went scurrying by the newspapers on their heads or the coats buttoned up so tight. You never, or you see what I mean, said the person, the man. None of them ever look up, ever. He helped the children onto the bus. It had been a very great pleasure to meet all of you and a most happy afternoon. And he waved a red handkerchief as the bus pulled away. Goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye, they called. There was a sudden terrifying sound of rubber tires skidding to a stop, 
and the blaring sound of a car horn. Tom, Ben, and Lindy quickly turned in their seats and looked out of the back window of the bus. The little man was standing in the middle of the street, apologizing to the taxi driver who had nearly run him down. I bet he was looking up, grinned Ben. The bus turned a corner, and the scene disappeared from their view. Chapter 2 Tom turned to Lindy in annoyance. Boy, Lindy, you are the end. You talked and talked to that man. I don't even think we should have encouraged him. He seemed a little nutty as a fruitcake. Oh, I liked him, Lindy said defensively. Did you notice he was wearing blue and white striped socks? Ben laughed. I wonder if he was joking when he said there was something called a wang doodle. Oh, I bet you he wasn't, said Lindy. I bet he was, countered Tom. Anyway, I'm going to look that word up in the dictionary when we get home. Lindy peered out of the rain. The, bi the bus was passing a large park, and on the other side of it, half obscured by trees, she saw a tall, thin house with shuttered windows. Pointing to it, she asked Tom, Is that place really haunted? Sure. Who lives there? A terrible ogre and a witch with yellow fangs. Well, nobody's sure about that, Ben said. But most people stay away from there, Lindy, especially on Halloween. Well, it wouldn't scare me, she declared. I don't believe in ogres, just fairies. You mean you wouldn't be scared to go up and knock on that front door, Tom said. Not at all. I bet you would. I wouldn't, Lindy raised her chin defiantly. Well, I'll make a bet. I bet you five cents that you won't go and knock on that front door of the stone house on Tuesday night, said Tom. Oh, that's not a good bet, Lindy hedged. Okay, then I'll make it 25 cents. The little girl hesitated. She wanted more than anything to join her brothers this year for Halloween, but she wasn't at all sure that she'd have the courage to do what Tom had suggested. Besides which, 25 cents represented her week's allowance. See, you are scared, Tom said triumphantly. No, I'm not, she declared loudly. It's a bet. Stop it, you two. You're both being so stupid, Ben said. Don't look at me. She's the one who started it. If she's too scared to do it, then why doesn't she say so? I'm not too scared. Okay, Ben threw up his hands in disgust, but remember, Mom will probably make the final decision about it anyway. The subject came up again that night at dinner. Lindy, what would you like to do about trick-or-treating this Halloween? Mr. Potter asked. Lindy looked at her brothers. Tom stopped eating and watched her intently across the table. I was wondering if I could go with Tom and Ben. Mrs. Potter looked at her boys. What do you think, boys? Well, I don't know, replied Ben. It's fine for the other two. I mean, they're just there to tag along and everything, but I'm always the one who has to be in charge. I mean, look at today. I was constantly watching out for Lindy and trying to stop her and Tom arguing. Mr. Potter smiled. Hmm, it's tough being the oldest, isn't it? Accepting responsibility is quite the chore sometimes. Sure is, Ben agreed solemnly. But that's the part of growing up, I'm afraid. Part of being 13 years old. Ben considered this. Lindy held her breath. I guess I don't really mind much, Ben said finally. I think that's very nice, Mrs. Potter seemed quite pleased. Then it's fine with us, Lindy, if that's what you'd like. Now, I suggest that we all sit by the fire for our last half hour before bedtime. Will one of you get the Sunday paper for your father? Ben ran and fetched it. The Sunday evening get-together had been a habit all of the Potter's life. They enjoyed it.
The children talked about any problems that may have arisen at school. Holiday plans were discussed, and everyone encouraged to exchange ideas. The children arranged themselves comfortably. Mrs. Potter took up her knitting, and Mr. Potter lit a pipe and settled back in his favorite chair and opened up the Bramblewood Sunday Courier. My word, Freda, look at this. What, dear? Professor Savant has been awarded the Nobel Prize. Oh, how nice. Who's Professor Savant? Tom wanted to know. Oh, he's the head of the biology research department at the university, Mr. Potter exclaimed. Well, what did he get the Nobel Prize for? Ben asked. According to this, for his work in genetics, said Mr. Potter. I don't even know what the Nobel Prize is, Lindy sounded bewildered. Mr. Potter looked over his glasses at his eldest son. Can you tell her, Ben? Ben thought for a moment. I think, he said slowly, that it's a prize given every year to people who have done something really great, like in chemistry or in writing or in medicine, something like that. That's very good, said Mr. Potter. It is also given for achievements in physics and physiology, and very importantly for the promotion of peace. Mrs. Potter interrupted her husband. I really think you should write to the professor, dear. Just a small letter of congratulations. It's really so wonderful for the university. Which reminds me, and she turned to the children, would you all start thinking about doing a card or letter to Grandma? You know she's not been at all well. It would mean so much to her to hear from all of you. Lindy, perhaps you could make one of your special cards. Okay. So tell us about the zoo today, said Mr. Potter. We met the funniest little man there, Lindy suddenly remembered. He told us about an animal called a wangdoodle. Have you ever heard of it, Daddy? A wangdoodle? No, I cannot say I have. What is it? I don't know. He said it looks a little bit like a horse. It has horns. I don't think there's such an animal, said Tom. I told him so. He said to look it up in the dictionary when we got home. Well, go ahead, said Mr. Potter. Tom ran into his father's study and took from the shelf a large, heavy black dictionary that had obviously seen a great deal of use. He carried it carefully back to the living room and placed it on the table. The children gathered around him as he thumbed through the tissue-thin pages. Watch band, waybill, webbing, Wessex, West Orange, whammy. Oh, here it is, he cried suddenly. It says wangdoodle. Ooh, what does it say? Lindy pushed close. It says, noun, slang, a fanciful creature of undefined nature. Tom looked up. What the heck does that mean? Mr. Potter rose up and knocked his pipe against the side of the fireplace. Well, it means that a wangdoodle is a made-up word for some kind of imaginary creature, which I would think is why the dictionary uses the word fanciful to describe it. So I was right, Tom said. A wangdoodle doesn't exist. Well, probably not, said Mr. Potter. There you are, Tom turned to Ben and Lindy. I told you. But you're not sure about that, Lindy protested. Yes, I am. I knew that old man was a phony. He, oh, he wasn't, Lindy turned to Ben. You don't think he was, do you, Ben? Oh, Lindy... <laughs> Who knows, Ben sighed. But if he wasn't a phony or crazy or anything, then what do you suppose he meant by all his talk? <sighs> well, we shall probably never find out, Mrs. Potter summoned up. Come on, children. It is time to get ready for bed. Well, that concludes our first section of The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles. Tune in next time. To find out what happens, does Lindy take the bet and actually knock on that stone house? 
and maybe we'll learn a little more about Professor Savant. Well, thank you for joining me for Snuggle in Storytime. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>